The following is a presentation of Apologetics Press. In the second session of Evolution is Religion, Not Science, uh, we're going to talk about how true science is the enemy of the evolutionists. And what we mean by that is when true science is applied, as scientific knowledge increases, as the amount of data available increases, it invariably refutes the theory of evolution. Again, this is contrary to what uh, we may have from reading in the popular press or reading in some of the pseudo-scientific journals, but uh, as we will see in this session, again, as true science is applied, as increased knowledge is gained, as increased data is gained, we find that that actually is the enemy of the evolutionists. Now, to give an example, what we're going to do is start out with uh, talking about, I guess what we'd say would be kind of the state of atheism or the state of the theory of evolution in the late 1800s. And as again we talked about in the first session, found that one of the most challenging problems for the evolutionists is how do you first get life arising from non-life? Uh, even in the late 1800s there was some knowledge that life must be very complex. Uh, people were beginning to realize that it didn't just spontaneously arise. Of course the experiments by Louis Pasteur and others were uh, clearly demonstrating that life only came from life, that life does not spontaneously arise from non-life. And so to counter that, uh, certain evolutionists uh, began to develop theories. They even wrote uh, books providing an alternative to the book of Genesis. But they would begin developing theories and looking for any evidence whatsoever that simple life might have existed or that somehow, again, a life could have arisen from non-life. And so we're going to look at some of the quotes uh, from those individuals. But one thing that's also useful is when we're going through this type of exercise is we should try to put ourselves in the position of being a Christian at this time. Because we can look back 100, 150 years and say, oh, well, that, was, that statement was silly or that idea was silly or no one would have ever really believed that. Uh, but again, realize that when these statements were being made, some of these individuals were some of the most respected scientists in the world. Uh, this was at a time when many Americans had not traveled more than, say, a few miles from their birthplace. Uh, many Americans didn't even have high school educations. And these were books and ideas being pushed, again, by some of the most prominent scientists in Europe. And I'm going to focus uh, uh, three slides, or actually be four slides, uh, talking about some of the ideas of Ernst Haeckel. Now, Ernst Haeckel, he wrote a book called The History of Creation. It was published in 1876. And right up front, we can see from his title, one of the things he was trying to get at was, you know, not to necessarily believe Genesis, not to believe the Bible, but, you know, this was the true history of creation, the history of creation as presented by Ernst Haeckel or as discovered by Ernst Haeckel. And uh, this is some quotes uh, from this book, and he's talking about organisms that he called Monera uh, that were trying to address this problem about how would you get life from non-life. And so reading uh, uh, some of the quotes, uh, starts out, he says, During late years, we have become acquainted with Monera, organisms which are, in fact, not composed of any organs at all, but consist entirely of shapeless, simple, homogeneous matter. The entire body of one of these Monera during life is nothing more than a shapeless, mobile, little lump of mucus or slime consisting of an albuminous combination of carbon. Simpler or more imperfect organisms we cannot possibly conceive. And so by saying simpler or more imperfect organisms we cannot possibly conceive, uh, right there he's trying to uh, refute the idea that life is very complex. He's trying to refute the idea that God created life uh, uh, perfectly, created life in a, in a very uh, exquisite way. He's trying to refute that uh, through these observations that he uh, claims to have made of these organisms called Monera. Uh, reading on, again, uh, from the same book, History of Creation. It says, the first complete observations on the natural history of a Moneron were made by me at Nice in 1864. The other very remar remarkable Monera I examined later, 1866, in Lanzarote, one of the Canary Islands, and in 1867 in the Straits of Gibraltar. The complete history of one of these Monera, the orange-red Protomyxa arantiaca, is represented in plate one, and his explanation is given in the appendix. I have found some curious Monera also in the North Sea, off the Norwegian coast near Bergen. And so, again, he's uh, making the case here that uh, these organisms are real, and that he's observed them, and that he has somehow uh, uh, established the behavior or the history of these particular organisms. Again, 
put ourselves in the position of a Christian in the late 1800s who's put their faith in the Bible, now being confronted by one of the leading scientists in Europe uh, claiming that he's found these simple, imperfect life forms and that he has uh, studied them and, and observed them continually. Third quote, or third slide with quote. Perhaps the most remarkable of all Monera was discovered by Huxley, the celebrated English duologist, and called Bithybius Hecali. Bithybius means living in the deep. This wonderful organism lives in immense depths of the ocean, which are over 12,000, indeed in some parts 24,000 feet below the surface, and which have become known to us within the last 10 years through the laborious investigations made by the English. And so in this slide, what we see is, is Heckel is not only claiming that he has discovered these organisms, but also that other leading scientists, other famous scientists, have also discovered these organisms and have made similar, uh, similar observations, similar studies as he has. Now, again, theme of this session is true science is the enemy of the evolutionists. Well, what happened was, is while all of these claims were being made about Monera, uh, a discovery was made. And that discovery was that Monera were really just simple, lifeless, uh, inorganic compounds. And that evidence was available as early as 1875, which is interesting. That was before Heckel published his book. And that year it was determined that alleged Monera were nothing more than amorphous gypsum precipitated out of seawater by alcohol. Now, however, even with clear refutation from true operational science, Monera continued to be presented as fact for over 50 years by atheists seeking to support Darwinian religions. In fact, at the final printing of uh, History of Creation, Monera were still included, and that printing was, uh, I believe it occurred in 1923. So again, uh, this particular idea of somehow establishing that life uh, could arise from non-life uh, via these simple forms, it was promulgated for about 50 years, but again, in the end, as true science advanced, shown to be false. Now, uh, other attempts by evolutionists to address this problem. In 1952, an experiment, uh, the Miller-Urey experiment, was performed. And the idea behind this experiment was to uh, devise an atmosphere, devise kind of a mixture of chemicals that if that somehow amino acids could be formed relatively simply. And so, in other words, devise a atmosphere you know, based, based on studies of chemistry that if, say, a spark was passed through that atmosphere or some other, you know, relatively natural phenomena occurred that you could show amino acids would form. And so what we have on the Miller-Urey experiment, as taught in biology books, is uh, first it was an attempt to simulate conditions under which theory of evolution predicts life could be spontaneously generated. The idea was to pass water, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen through a spark. Uh, it couldn't have oxygen present because that would destroy the building blocks of life uh, amino acids were formed, and this showed, according to the biology text, the basic building blocks of life can assemble spontaneously. This is a diagram showing the uh, uh, Miller-Urey experiment, again showing the uh, chemicals that were passed through uh, and sparked to form the, uh, potentially form the amino acids. And so that's what's taught on the amino acid. But there's several things, uh, re, uh, I'm sorry, that's what's taught uh, by the miller about the miller experiment. But there are several things about the miller experiment that are very important technically, but are not taught. Uh, first of all, building blocks of DNA and proteins are molecules which can exist in both right and left-handed forms. In other words, mirror images. In all living systems, DNA and RNA are composed exclusively of right-handed nucleotides, while the amino acids and proteins in living systems occur only in left-handed form. Now this is important because with amino acids and with nucleotides, the, uh, when they form proteins and when the nucleotides form DNA, it's not just the chemistry of those molecules that is, are important, but it's also the physical structure. And so as we see in proteins, the uh, physical structure of the protein requires that any of the amino acids that, that illustrate a handedness, any of the amino acids that uh, show either a left-handed or a right-handed form, those amino acids need to all be left-handed to have the structure of the protein necessary for that protein to function. And so, again, very important for all of the amino acids that show handedness to be left-handed. Uh, likewise, for DNA, in other words, in, uh, in order for that molecule to have the double helix structure that is necessary for that molecule to function, all the nucleotides in the DNA need to be right-handed. And so, uh, again, very important, uh, uh, very well known. Uh, but what's not mentioned relative to the miller experiment is in that type of experiment, uh, there's an even mix form. There's an even mix of left-handed and right-handed amino acids in the case of uh, forming amino acids to form proteins, and that mix is totally unsuitable 
for forming a functional protein. Uh, just to give a, uh, an idea, the uh, uh, chemistry required by evolution results in even mix of right and left-handed nucleotides and amino acids. And again, attempts to contrive scenarios that somehow purify, that somehow lead to more uh, entirely left-handed amino acids have failed. Now, the smallest protein consists of about 70 amino acids. And so that's 70 amino acids in the smallest protein. And if to randomly pick from this mix of amino acids, this even mix of left-handed and right-handed amino acids, to somehow uh, randomly pick from that and get 70 in a row that were all left-handed, it would be like flipping a coin 70 times and having it always come up heads or always come up tails. And so that it's a very unlikely that that would occur. In fact, the odds of that occurring are about one in one followed by 21 zeros. In other words, a one in 10 to the 21st of somehow being able to take this mix of amino acids that could have been formed in an experiment such as the Miller-Urey experiment or in a, a means or, or in the same way that the Miller-Urey experiment proposed, somehow uh, being able to get all left-handed amino acids out of that. So it's very low odds. Now that's just for a very simple protein. If we take a more uh, complicated protein, say hemoglobin, that has 574 amino acids, uh, we're looking at odds of about 1 in 1 followed by 175 zeros. Again, these are numbers that are very difficult to imagine. But so just from a standpoint of the amino acids all being left-handed needed to form these types of complex proteins. Again, the odds there alone show uh, that particular approach or that particular aspect of evolutionary theory to be impossible. Now, here's an, an interesting question, though. It's, uh, we're talking about evolution is religion, not science. And so someone might still say, well, maybe there's you know, something we don't understand, or maybe uh, you know, they might have you know, faith that there's some mechanism that we haven't discovered yet that could purify uh, these amino acids, but a real important question would be, why isn't the problem even mentioned? Uh, when you look at even advanced biology textbooks, uh, they will talk about racemization, and that's what's, uh, what it's called when you have uh, uh, left-handed and right-handed amino acids when, uh, uh, after an organism dies, uh, based on the uh, conversion of some of the left-handed uh, amino acids back to right-handedness, you can actually get a reasonable estimate for how long the organism has been dead for. But that's the only mention of racemization, and the, ch the chapter is concerning evolution not mentioned at all. And so the question is, if evolution was really science, why are they evolutionists afraid to present all of the data? Why don't the evolutionists present this extremely relevant data uh, that would again show, contrary to the claims that are made about the Miller-Urey experiment, that that experiment really has limited ap applicability or really shows a limited amount relative to the theory of evolution. And so that's a, uh, just an important question. If it was truly science, why isn't all of the data presented? Why is there a certain fear amongst the evolutionists to get all of the data out on the table? And that's, again, uh, just additional evidence uh, showing that the theory really is religion and not uh, at all conducted, or the promotion of the theory is not at all conducted in a way that, that would uh, occur if it was a true scientific theory. Uh, several other things are not taught relative to this experiment. First of all, tip. Uh, Evolution or the development of proteins, evolutionists will typically say that it occurred in some kind of a watery environment. Well, one of the problems is, is that amino acids uh, don't form long chains in a watery environment. They actually, water tends to break up the amino acids. And again, using the same example, in a watery environment, only about 1% of amino acids would exist in a, a chain of two amino acids. So in other words, if it had a, a watery solution containing a lot of amino acids, only 1% of those amino acids would exist in a chain of two. Only 0.01% would exist in a chain of three. And again, to get to 70 amino acids in a row, just, just to have that long of a string, which would be the simplest protein, and not even caring which amino acids they were. Of course, the protein has to have very specific amino acids in that sequence. Uh, just to get to that string would be one in one followed by 140 zeros. Again, uh, numbers that are, are uh, impossible to comprehend uh, you know, the, the odds against that occurring. And so uh, we know that uh, the amino acids can't string together in a watery environment, but the problem is it's very difficult to postulate uh, non-watery environments in which uh, you wouldn't have either extensive racemization or have other issues that would break down the amino acids and again uh, prohibit them from, uh, from forming into a, a significant or to a, into a protein. And so again, major issue with the just getting a long string of amino acids to hold together, even if it wasn't for the fact that all those amino acids needed to be left-handed. 
Also is not mentioned is that only a very small portion of the product of the Miller year experiment was amino acids. It was less than 2%. The remainder of the product, 85% roughly was tar and 13% was carboxylic acid. Now both tar and carboxylic acid are toxic to living systems. Again, trying to somehow show a way that life could randomly arise and, and only at a very simple level, really only trying to show a way that maybe a simple protein could arise, which again is a, a tremendous distance away from life. But even just showing that a simple protein could arise, uh, even in that experiment, they showed that the majority of the products would actually be toxic to the life that supposedly was trying to create itself. Again, uh, a person could still put their faith in, in this type of experiment working, but from a scientific standpoint, in the discussion of the Miller-Urey experiment, why isn't any of this mentioned? And again, this is from reviewing all of the major biology textbooks. None of them mention these glaring issues, this data that's very important if the goal really was to have the student develop an objective scientific opinion or an objective uh, uh, scientific interpretation of the evidence. So again, uh, big question is how can uh, evolutionists claim to be pro-science when data that is very relevant to their theory is purposely withheld? Uh, other uh, points that are uh, uh, typically left out of the uh, discussion, there's a great deal of discussion and really even the evolutionists themselves have now rejected the proposed atmosphere. In other words, even evolutionists no longer believe that the atmosphere proposed by Miller and Urey could have ever existed on Earth. Uh, again, that's important. The atmosphere proposed by Miller and Urey, it was not based on evidence, not based on the idea that that atmosphere ever actually existed. That mix of gases was deemed a possible way to create amino acids, which indeed they did. Uh, but again, the atmosphere was proposed to try to make the experiment work not based on any evidence that that atmosphere ever actually existed. And again, even evolutionists today agree that that proposed atmosphere uh, could not have existed on Earth. Even, it, with, uh, even with their assumptions, it would not have been stable. Another uh, important point when someone has a scientific theory is to try to test it. And what was uh, exciting was there was actually a chance to test this theory. And by testing that theory, uh, the atmosphere of Jupiter is actually fairly similar to the atmosphere proposed by Miller and Urey. And so on the planet Jupiter, uh, there is an atmosphere similar to what the atmosphere that Miller, Urey were proposing, Miller and Urey were proposing in their experiment. And we were able to send a probe to that in 1996. And so that was Galileo that put a probe into the Jovian atmosphere. And many evolutionists were very excited about this. There was a uh, thought that there were, we would at least find some very complex organic molecules, and some evolutionists went as far as saying that we should find life, or that there was a good chance that we would see uh, life floating around in the clouds of Jupiter. Well, this is a summary of the findings of that particular probe, and I, uh, this was uh, out of the uh, magazine Sky and Telescope reported on it. Again, a very magazine that's typically very favorable towards evolutionists, but also uh, typically is, is a very objective magazine. And so I want to read this quote to you. It says, another blow to scientists' expectations was the paucity of complex organic molecules, which laboratory studies had suggested should be present. Some researchers have even postulated that prebiotic compounds or even life itself might exist in the Jovian atmosphere. Yet the mass spectrometer found nothing fancier than simple carbon-based species like ethane. There aren't any little critters floating around in the clouds, concludes Neiman. And that's a reference to uh, Hasso B. Neiman, NASA Goddard, who led one of the teams analyzing results from the probe. And also, in addition to the original Miller-Urey experiment, numerous other experiments have been contrived and performed, again, trying to show some credible mechanism that long strings, long strings of amino acids or proteins could form. And all of those, all of those experiments have failed. There has never been an a, a experiment showing a credible way to form even a simple protein, which is, again, a tremendously long distance away from a, a simple life form. Uh, another line of reasoning that's sometimes point, pushed by evolutionists is, well, yeah, it seems impossible, and we're unable to duplicate this in the laboratory. And uh, yes, uh, the thought of life somehow spontaneously arising from non-life uh, just doesn't seem realistic, but they'll say, but boy, given lots and lots of time, maybe that could happen. And so they, they try to imply that maybe given billions of years, right now the, their estimate for the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years, and they try to imply that maybe giving just given this tremendous amount of time that somehow that makes their theory credible, somehow that makes uh, uh, the, just the basic chemistry or the things that would need to happen for life to spontaneously arise from non-life, uh, that somehow that makes that credible. And probably the first 
uh, at least very well publicized attempt to talk about long periods of time or talk about uh, what time could do for the theory of evolution. Uh, it was a debate that occurred in 1860, and this was a debate between uh, Thomas Huxley, and he said that given six, he uh, said, proposed that given six monkeys, six typewriters, and unlimited time, the monkeys would eventually type all of the books in the British Library. So what we, we're going to do is spend a slide just talking about, well, how much time would that really take? Again, evolutionists feel right now that the universe is about 13.7 billion years old. Probably the longest age that any evolutionist is still clinging to is maybe 20 billion years old for the universe. And so the real question is, is does that make any difference? Is there uh, going to be a significant difference whether the universe is uh, 6,000 or 6 million or 6 billion or, or 6 trillion, for that matter, years old? Or the odds against the types of reactions, the types of events that the evolutionists are proposing, are they just so overwhelming that time really doesn't matter? So what we want to do is go ahead and we'll use um, Huxley's analogy. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, pretend we have a typewriter. So you picture a typewriter, but this isn't a regular typewriter. This would be a typewriter that maybe you'd buy a, a three-year-old. And the idea being is that this child, you're trying to teach this child letters. And so you buy a typewriter for the child, and all it has is 26 letters. There's no uppercase. There's no lowercase. There's no punctuation marks. Just the 26 letters on the typewriter. And say uh, uh, they leave the room, and the pet cat comes into the room, and, and it starts randomly hitting keys. And this is, again, analogous to the uh, six monkeys and the six typewriters uh, just kind of typing away. And they're trying to type, again, all of the books in the British Library. And so uh, so we can look at, okay, well, what are the odds, again, the idea of just randomly hitting letters, what are the odds of certain events happening? And so uh, if we start out and we say, okay, what are the odds of uh, the cat or, you know, whatever random, you know, creature we want to use of, of hitting a W? So what are the odds of randomly hitting a W for the first letter? Well, again, there's 26 letters on the keyboard, and so the odds of hitting a W would be 1 in 26. <clears throat> you know, again, 26 options, 1 in 26 that a W will be hit. Now, after the W is hit, uh, what would be the odds of hitting an E? So on the second stroke, uh, suppose, uh, uh, again, totally random, what would be the odds of hitting an E? Well, the odds of hitting an E are 1 in 26 also, and so the odds of hitting a W followed by an E are 1 in 26 times 1 in 26, or that's you know, 1 in, in uh, 676. So we have odds of 1 in 676 of hitting W, E. Now, we can go a little bit further with this. Uh, suppose we want to look at uh, a, a fairly simple string and say uh, we are. Okay, so what are the odds of hitting just a string W-E-A-R-E -E, on this particular typewriter? Well, if we take 26 times 20, 1 in 26 times 1 in 26 times 1 in 26 times 1 in 26 times 1 in 26, uh, we get odds that are, are a little worse than 1 in 11 million. And so now you're starting to think, well, wow, that's, uh, you know, those are pretty bad odds. If I just wanted to type we are, I'm down to 1 in Again, a little worse than 11 million. Well, what if we want to type uh, something like we are a bunch of monkeys? Well, to type we are a bunch of monkeys, now the odds have gone up to 1 in almost 2 times 10 to the 28th power. So again, that's 1 in, one in, one in 2 followed by 28 zeros. Just to type we are a bunch of monkeys. Well, that's, that's starting to get really unlikely now. Again, uh, a number followed by 28 zeros is something that's really beyond our ability to comprehend. Let's give a, a final example, at least with, with this line of reasoning. What if we wanted to type, we are a bunch of monkeys trying to type something that makes sense. It's not working yet, but maybe given infinite time. Well, we look at the odds for that. Now we're up to a staggering 1 in 6.89 followed by 135 zeros. So again, 1 in, uh, I'm sorry, 1 in almost 7 followed by 135 zeros. In other words, 1 in 6.89 times 10 to the 135th power. Now what's important to note on these odds is that I go back to the evolutionist uh, claim of how old the universe is, and I look at the evolutionists, again, saying at most that the universe is 20 billion years old. Well, 20 billion years is only about 6 times 10 to the 23rd microseconds. In other words, if I look at 20 billion years and I divide that up into millionths of a second, I get roughly 6 followed by 23 zeros, millionths of a second. So that's 6 times... 20, 10 to the 23rd microseconds, uh, that's nothing compared to a, a number followed by 135 zeros. In other words, the number of microseconds in 20 billion years, the 20 billion years that evolutionists will claim makes anything possible, uh, is 
trivial compared to the odds of just randomly typing a simple string of, of about 96 letters. Uh, we can go even beyond that. Most evolutionists will say that the total number of atoms in the universe, so this is atoms in the entire universe, is less than 1 followed by 80 zeros. In other words, the total number of atoms in the universe is less than 10 to the 80th. Again, a tiny number compared to the odds we just looked at uh, for typing a, a relatively sim simple string of letters. And so when an evolutionist, when, when discussing things with an evolutionist and pre presenting the evidence that their theory really isn't scientific and in fact science proves their theory wrong, uh, a lot of times this will get thrown back. Well, yeah, it looks impossible, uh, but again, we've got lots and lots and lots of time. Well, the time available, even by the evolutionist's own uh, grossly inflated age for the universe, is still trivial compared to the time that would be needed for any of the events that they require to happen or postulate having happened uh, to have actually occurred. And we go a little further with this. Again, the example we just used had 96 letters. Uh, DNA in the simplest bacteria has over 1 million nucleotide pairs. The chemical, also, uh, another very important point is that the chemical letters that are uh, used uh, to make up the DNA. In other words, the chemical letters in the DNA, the nucleotides are the chemical letters in the DNA of a bacteria. They're not permanently placed. Uh, it's kind of like what we saw with the amino acids in a water environment. Uh, say an amino acid might bond to another string of amino acids and then it would immediately be debonded. And so the same thing occurs. And so this, uh, when if uh, say a a long string of nucleotides was attempting to form. And so what would really happen, a better analogy would actually be every time the monkeys type a letter, uh, that that letter very quickly jumps back off the page and, and maybe goes back into the typewriter. In other words, just picture uh, letters being typed by these monkeys that are, again, trying to type all the works of the British Library. But every time they type a letter, it almost instantaneously gets erased. And so that, again, makes it even uh, less credible uh, for those in the analogies case for those books to be typed, but also less credible that anything such as a protein or DNA could randomly form. Now, every now and then someone will say, well, I wrote this computer program or I saw this computer program and it, it showed that uh, amino acids or you know, long strings of amino acids or proteins or DNA could f actually form quite quickly. Uh, and just want to point out, you know, computer programs with kind of predetermined results, uh, they're irrelevant. That's not what we're looking at here. Uh, and so, it's easy to program a computer to do whatever someone wants the computer to do. And again, if it's a predetermined result that the computer is seeking, that is not at all analogous to the idea of, of proteins or DNA randomly forming. But again, more importantly, uh, as we talked about in the previous session, you know, if it could happen, if it was so easy to happen randomly, why can't we do it in a lab? In other words, if these events are really uh, you know, events that you know, supposedly you know, a computer program says they could work or are given enough time they could work, I mean, why can't we come anywhere close to doing this in a laboratory? And, and of course, we can't. And so uh, that's kind of the fundamental question. Again, I can program a computer to say whatever I want to say. I can uh, you know, uh, you know, claim things based on experiments uh, and selectively presenting information or selectively presenting results of those experiments. But really, the bottom line comes back down to, OK, if it's that easy, or so easy that it could happen randomly, why can't we do it, again, given our smartest PhDs, virtually unlimited funding, and laboratories that are unimaginably sophisticated? Another point that's not taught, uh, but this is important too, is that you know, even if the DNA molecule somehow arose spontaneously, uh, DNA, is, it has, it's really a, a language. It's a, a chemical language that encodes for all the physical characteristics that we see in life. Now, what's also interesting about DNA is not just, is it only just a language and an information storage system, but it's also incredibly sophisticated and incredibly uh, compact form of information storage. And so DNA itself, it's digital, it's error correcting, it's redundant, and it's overlapping. And so in other words, when I, if I have a mutation, if I get uh, hit by some radiation or a chemical reaction causes a mutation, uh, my DNA almost always will correct itself, it's error correcting. Uh, if it didn't do that, I, I'd have a very short life expectancy. And so the DNA is, is a error correcting. When I have uh, certain uh, functions, certain chemicals that are vital to my survival, uh, the DNA, it's redundant. In other words, that particular function is coded for in multiple locations. So if one of those locations is damaged, uh, that function can still be performed. That uh, I don't lose that particular uh, capability, or that capability that's needed for uh, for survival. And also the information story is overlapping. And this is uh, something that's uh, incredibly sophisticated in that 
the coding for certain characteristics rather than uh, say sequential storage like we're used to seeing in, in uh, computers or when we think about uh, you know, writing something down in a lab book, any, any type of information storage, we're thinking about uh, doing things sequentially. DNA actually has areas where it's actually overlapping. In other words, a certain function or a certain characteristic is coded for, but rather than waiting to the end of that sequence to start coding for the next function or the next uh, type of physical characteristic, it's actually overlapping, and so it's some of the same string can be used. And so a very, very sophisticated language, very sophisticated information storage system. It's so sophisticated that, again, it's something uh, using some of our, our smartest PhDs in information sciences. We're still trying to duplicate an information storage system, or not, not even duplicate, come up with an information storage system that's even uh, a fraction as sophisticated as the information storage that we see in DNA. And so, again, very uh, uh, important points, very relevant to the debate of, of life somehow spontaneously arising from non-life. Because, again, all we've talked about for the last several slides are just the odds of a protein randomly assembling itself, or just the odds of a single strand of DNA randomly assembling itself. And we can see, again, no matter how much time, given uh, the maximum age that any evolutionist will claim for the universe, uh, time does not matter. Be because again, just the odds of even those relatively small steps towards creating life are so overwhelmingly against that occurring. Um, uh, just again, just based, based on uh, some, some very simple first steps. And so again, what's really not taught I think to sum it up is that uh, simple life is vastly more complex than anything man has ever created. And that's again something we need to keep in mind when we start claiming that it's somehow scientific to teach that life just randomly makes itself from non-life. Again, realize that this is, that is less credible than claiming the most sophisticated machine that man has ever created just made itself. In other words, because we are incapable of making life from non-living chemicals, to claim that happened randomly is less capable, is less credible than claiming anything we are capable of happened randomly. And so again, if I was to claim life just randomly assembled itself, I might as well claim that super supercomputers or space shuttles could also randomly assemble themselves because supercomputers and space shuttles are simpler than the simplest life. Finally, for this session, and I think this is also very important because it's not mentioned in any of the textbooks, you actually have to go back and look at the writings of the individual atheists. And so what's not taught is that atheists themselves have calculated the odds of their theory on life origin being correct. And we talked about, again, the formation of a simple protein. And we came out with odds, you know, again, that were fairly staggering against that happening. Well, Non-Christians have done this also. Carl Sagan, a very noted evolutionist, he's in fact one of the individuals that was at least hopeful that maybe we would find life in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Well, he also calculated the odds of a simple protein forming, and he came up with numbers similar to what we discussed. He said one in one followed by 130 zeros. In other words, one in 10 to the 130th power of just a simple protein forming. Uh, Fred Hoyle, we quoted him earlier. We'll have some quotes from him uh, later on also. Uh, he looked at maybe, you know, what would be the odds, just the proteins in an amoeba. And again, when we say just the proteins, this isn't uh, the specificity needed. It's not the, the proteins being in the right place. It doesn't include uh, cell walls, other structures of the DNA, anything that would be needed in the, uh, to make the amoeba actually an amoeba. But just the proteins in an amoeba, he calculated the odds at one and one followed by 40,000 zeros. And again, he's, he's a non-Christian. Now, to Fred Hoyle's credit, uh, that drove him away from believing in evolution. Uh, when he did that uh, calculation, he realized that evolution couldn't work. Again, we'll talk about in later sessions where that drove him to. Uh, unfortunately, to our knowledge, he did not become a Christian. But again, just, uh, just by calculating the odds of just the proteins in an amoeba, he realized that evolution uh, as a theory was, was bunk. It, it could not work. Uh, one in, again, one followed by 40,000 zeros for just the proteins in an amoeba. And then uh, Harold Morowitz, he tried to do a calculation uh, just looking at what it would take for simple, the chemicals in a simple organism. And so he chose a, a simple organism, just looking at what it would take for those chemicals to randomly arise. Now he came up with odds of one in one followed by 100 billion zeros. So again, one in one followed by 100 billion zeros. And this is, again, a calculation performed by an evolutionist. And so uh, it's really mind boggling that people, especially people knowledgeable enough to perform these types of calculations, knowledgeable enough to understand the chemistry that's involved, knowledgeable enough to understand the complexity involved, 
it's, it's mind-boggling that they still choose to put their faith in this particular theory. But again, uh, I think just, again, to close the session, we all get to choose where we put our faith, and uh, that is a choice people make. But again, going back to the theme uh, of this series, again, it's easy to show that evolution, again, if anything, science refutes it. It is certainly not a scientific theory, and again, it is religion and not science. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the defense of New Testament Christianity. Visit us on the web at apologeticspress.org or call 800-234-8558.